Uh, he's going to talk to us tonight about the Synod, upcoming Synod, and how it can strengthen our prayer, Eucharistic revival, and evangelization. And as we go through, I want you all to know that on March 19th, the Feast of St. Joseph this year, we're setting aside a day for some small groups to take part in what the Archbishop is asking them for with the Synod. Okay. Thanks, Father Matt. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're going to do a technology check. <clears throat> Looking good. Let's see if I can clip this. Let's see if we can get this through. Thanks for having me back. Oh, I can't get it through that hole, but maybe, can you hear me? Okay, if it's, let me know if you can't hear me. I know that's not coming directly through your speaker, but yeah, let me know and we can, we can adjust. Well, so my last time I was here was the fall of 2018 for a dinner and doctrine. And my topic was the synod on young people. <laughs> so I'm back talking about a synod on synodality. And uh, before, before I begin, I just want to ask, who's heard of this synod, of synod on synodality, like before tonight? Okay, a couple. Um, based on like what you've heard, like do you have questions, concerns, like have you heard enough to understand what it's about? Still kind of, there's, there's more that needs to be learned. Hey, well, you're, so that's, that's way beyond, I think, a lot of people generally. So we have somebody read the preparatory document, so that's, that's pretty huge. But for the, for the most part, though, I would say most of you haven't really heard much about the Synod, right? So I, I hope tonight will be a help in kind of getting more of the background of the Synod. I'm going to spend a bit more time on history and theology kind of leading up to to understand why we're going through this today. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time on the archdiocesan process, but you all will also be able to get more of that with Father Matt, and I'm happy to take questions afterwards too, so I hope it'll be helpful. I wanna begin with the prayer that's been adapted for this synod, but it's, a, it's an old prayer that has been used uh, before ecumenical councils when bishops gathering together. You probably cannot see it there, but I will, I will read it for everybody um, as our opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We stand before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name. With you alone to guide us, make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are weak and sinful. Do not let us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance lead us down the wrong path, nor partiality influence our actions. Let us find in you our unity, so that we may journey together to eternal life and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask of you, who are at work in every place and time, in the communion of the Father and the Son, forever and ever, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This prayer is called the Ad Sumus Sancte Spiritus. We stand before you, Holy Spirit. And it's an ancient prayer invoking the Holy Spirit. And, and this is really what a synod is in the very first place. It's a call to the Holy Spirit. It's an invoking the Holy Spirit for discernment, for prayer, for listening. Synods have been part of the history of the church. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But at the base of every synod is a call to prayer. It's the bishops, other leaders of the church gathering together, seeking the Holy Spirit's help and guidance. So this evening I'll talk a bit about this global synod, the Synod on Synodality, and, and hopefully by the end um, you'll get a, a better sense of what it's about. 
background and purpose and spend some time on just what does this mean for us? You know, why is this important? And focus in a little bit more on the archdiocese, but also on us as individual Catholics, as disciples, and what does this mean for us here concretely? So first, what is a synod? And so in the, I'd like to start with the term synod because it reveals a lot. It's a very rich word. Um, it's derived from the Greek for together and way, or on the way. So soon, together, hodos, way. And so anybody familiar with the Bible, familiar with the Acts of the Apostles and how the early Christians were described as followers of the way. And you see that kind of interspersed through Acts of the Apostles everywhere. It's a really rich meaning there. Christians have always kind of understood themselves as being on the way together, like in Christ. Who is the way? It's Jesus, right? And so the way, being on the way, being in the church, being called together, being the assembly of the people of God called together to be on the way, to be pilgrims, knowing that this is not, this is not our destination. It's a beautiful, beautiful place, uh, but with trials and sufferings as well that have been redeemed. But we're, we're destined for something greater. We're destined to be in communion with God himself, eternal life with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in heaven. But so this word synod means on the way together, journeying together. So you'll see in these, uh, you know, those who read the preparatory document, or you'll see as you read more about the synod, as you learn more about it, you'll see the word journeying together as a way to describe what, what synod or synodality means, and we'll break open that term a little bit too. But on a practical level, the term synod has generally referred to special meetings of bishops and leaders throughout the history of the church when they need to discuss, discern, pray through matters, and, 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 and offer judgments, offer, offer teaching. And again, as I said at the beginning, that's all, it's all grounded in you know, the truth of God's revelation and the work of the Holy Spirit guiding the church, guiding the church to all truth. And so synods have been part of the church from the very beginning. So let's look at that in the life of the church. We, we see it throughout the last 2,000 years. The first millennium was full of synods, but also the second millennium too. As Catholics, we're a little bit more familiar with the term council, right? At least ecumenical council um, as the special. And those are really the, the most authoritative synods of bishops that we have. You know, universal meetings of, of bishops to deal with various issues that come uh, before them, before the church. But we also have synods at a more local level. Dioceses have synods. Parishes can have synods as well. And at that, at that level, we're more familiar with kind of a call for like everybody participating. So, and you see on the screen the 21 ecumenical councils that we recognize, the Catholic Church recognizes as authoritative, not including the Council of Jerusalem, which was an important council that we read about in the Acts of the Apostles. And so there's a well-established history when it comes to synods in the life of the church. But, but looking more for the past, say, about 60 years or so, you're looking back to the Second Vatican Council, and, and right at the end of the council in 1965, the Pope St. Paul VI instituted what is known as the Synod of Bishops. And this was a way to, to renew this, you know, after coming out of an ecumenical council, and Paul VI said, you know, it's really important for us to gather together in larger numbers more regularly to deal with matters that come before the church, and not to wait necessarily for the next ecumenical council, which is a gathering of the whole world's bishops, but to do it in a more targeted way, to have a Synod of Bishops actually an office and in Rome that would organize targeted meetings. Generally, it's been every few years that you have a Synod of Bishops. So since 1967 was the first of these kind of more recent Synod of Bishops meetings, and there's been, been a variety of them since then. Um, the first ordinary Synod of Bishops took place in 1967, and the topic was preserving and strengthening the Catholic faith. And you think of that topic, and it's like, that's that's a good topic. Like, I don't think we've gone beyond that, right? That's, a, that's an important topic. And you see all these different 
places where, you know, where the church has kind of focused efforts on evangelization, catechesis, you know, different, different areas around vocations, on the family um, and young people, very important topics. So Pope Francis, as we know, um, really from the get-go of his papacy, has emphasized the importance of synods. And I think everybody here will remember the, the two first synods that he called. One was an extraordinary synod on the family, followed by an ordinary synod on the family. So, so he, he thought a lot of attention needed to be placed on, on the mission of the family, for the church, for the world. And then he had a synod on young people, a synod on the Amazon region. But now the synod on synodality. And what's... So this upcoming synod right now is the 16th of these ordinary synods that have been called since Paul the sixth time. Um, and, and I'm not going to get into all the distinctions. There have been a few extraordinary synods. One was that extraordinary synod on the family and then some special assemblies. I think the synod on the Amazon was actually one of those that reflects one of those special assemblies of synods. But now, but, but Pope Francis, for, for some years now, really since 2015, is when he gave uh, the address to the bishops. This was around the 50th anniversary of when Pope Paul VI instituted the Synod of Bishops. And Pope Francis gave this address on the significance of synods in the life of the church. And he used this term synodality. And he said the church needs to be more synodal. We need to grow in, in being more synodal. What, so what is this, what is this about? Um, and so he's called the synod now to actually dive deeper into this theme. So obviously there's, a, there's a, a, something different here happening. You know, like we've had synods in the church for a long time. But synodality, what, what is that about? You know, that obviously the Holy Father is wanting us to, to reflect on this as it relates to who, what the church is, how she operates in the world. So, I mean, just a little background. So we, we know the church is not just the Pope. We know the church is not just the bishops. We know the church is not just Father Matt, like in the parish. You know, the church is the whole people of God together. Now, divinely instituted with a hierarchy, you know, to, in, it's divinely instituted. It's not going to change. It's not going to go away. But you know, one of the things that the Second Vatican Council really helped recover after you know, several years of, several decades of renewal, kind of going back into the, the early church fathers and, and really renewing kind of this understanding of the church. You know, the hierarchy is here to first serve the mission of the laity. Well, obviously, well, to, with the sacramental ministry and that type of thing, but all of that, which is so vital for the church's life, is, is meant to kind of be the, the source of the mission of the laity. So the, the church doesn't transform the world simply through the visible institutions like the offices, the chanceries, even, even the parish buildings, that type of thing. That's not how the church transforms the world fully. It's through, it's through the mission of the laity out there in the world. It's all of you out there in the world proclaiming the gospel by the way you work, by the way you live, by the way you, you live your family life, by the way you relate to your neighbors and share with them who Jesus is. So this is the way the church has always been. At certain times, there's been different aspects of the church that, that have been emphasized, you know, many times because of different crises. Like I say, take the Reformation, for, for instance. You know, when the authority of the church is questioned and a lot of the visible aspects of the church are questioned, it, it's natural that a lot of the theology of the time and a lot of the teaching would focus on the institutional aspects of the church, which are vital for us. But sometimes in that, in that emphasis, some things were maybe lost. And so like the Second Vatican Council, for instance, brought a real strong focus on this universal call to holiness. We're, we're all called to holiness. We're all called to be saints, no matter where God places us, whether we're priests, religious life, laity. So getting back to synodality... Um, this is a new word. 
It's, it's a new word in the church, but it's expressing something fundamental about the church. Pope Francis says to walk together is the constitutive way of the church. So if we understand synodality in, in a very simple way as journeying together, walking together, that, that can be a first way of understanding synodality. And Pope Francis says this is a constitutive way of the church. Okay, let's, let's go a little deeper, though. So the Holy Father says this is the specific way of living and operating of the church, the people of God, which reveals and gives substance to her being as communion. When all her members journey together, gather in assembly, and take an active part in her evangelizing mission. So this, this walking together, this journeying together that, is, that synodality is, is describing, is trying to c- categorize. It's saying that that style of being church reveals who we are as communion. We are, we are made to be in communion with each other in Jesus Christ. And so all of us that were at Mass just recently and receiving Jesus, receiving our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, the Eucharist makes the church. We are, we are made one in Jesus through the Eucharist. This communion, this, uh, this understanding of the church as communion, synodality is a way of living that communion out, where we actually live as brothers and sisters. We walk together. But in this gathering and assembly, what is, the, what is the most important assembly that the church has? It's the Eucharistic assembly. So where, where the synod, this reality of synod, like we're doing it, folks. We're, we've been doing it. We do it at the most basic level when we gather together around the Lord in the Eucharist, united together. It's a beautiful thing, but it's, not, it's, it's nothing really new. And then taking an active part in our evangelizing mission and the evangelizing mission of the church. And this is where I, I really want to focus in on, and I think um, we have some, some beautiful uh, teaching now in, in reflection on this deeper aspect of synodality, which is just basic. It, it, it's just saying we, we are made for mission. We are made to be people. We are made to be disciples who are sent out, who are evangelizing. Missionary disciples, apostles, all of us, no matter who we are. So the International Theological Commission uh, in 2018 was reflecting on synodality. Because basically Pope Francis's address in 2015, I think, spurred a lot of attention to this concept. And there was a need to unpack it a little bit. So the ITC talks about the concept of synodality refers to the involvement and participation of the whole people of God in the life and mission of the church. This isn't anything new. This is something that's been especially prominent since the Second Vatican Council. Our popes have been emphasizing this, but it goes all the way back to the beginnings of the church. But, so it's, it's something that's really important to the life and mission of the church. So another quote, synodality means that the whole church is a subject, and that everyone in the church is a subject that is an agent of evangelization, co-responsible for the mission of the church. To me, this is the money quote in terms of really understanding what synodality is. And it can be, as a term, it can be abstract. It can, you know, it's because it's a newer term, it can sort of float above us. But to really understand it from this sense that Every one of us is a subject of the church's mission. We're we're co-responsible for the mission of the church. doesn't mean we all do the same thing, but it means we are called to our part in the church's mission of proclaiming the gospel, of introducing people to Jesus Christ. And we all have a place in that and all have a part in that. And so when the Pope is is talking about synodality and, and calling us to synodality. He's calling us to something very basic, something very rooted in, in who the church has been from the very beginning. But obviously over history, there can be times where you know, certain things are, are not as prominent. So Pope Francis in his address in 2015, he said, the world in which we live demands that the church strengthen cooperation in all areas of her mission. It is precisely this path of synodality which God expects of the church of the third millennium. It is precisely this path of synodality which God expects of the church of the third millennium. I repeat it because it's a, it's a strong statement. 
It's our Holy Father saying, this is, this is what God expects of us, synodality. This walking together, but it's not just a random walking together, it's a walking together in mission. It's really helping each other out. It's really living as brothers and sisters. You know, it's, it's walking with Father Matt in his ministry and supporting him. It's Father Matt walking with his laity, his flock, supporting them side by side. And all with different particular roles that still remain there, but leaning on each other, relying on one another. Like the Lord, the Lord doesn't want us to be alone. You know, he, he founded the church. He didn't, find, he didn't just kind of select one leader and say, like, go, go off and do it. He found 12, 12 men and gathered a whole community of men and women disciples around them to go change the world. But it's always together but this cooperation in all areas of our mission. Now for us, just, I guess just a, a reflection. So here in the United States, I think, I, think, I think we're at a different place than some other areas of the world. Um, and this has just been through my own anecdotal conversations, different leaders, different countries. Um, here, we've had a stronger sense of, I would say, lay participation, lay engagement, you know, the cooperation of the laity in different ways. Sometimes that's maybe been emphasized in the wrong way or, or not wrong, but incomplete, I would say. Like we have a lot of lay folks that have stepped up to different lay ministry areas in the church. So they're, they're you know, working in the church, serving the church like me <laughs> and Kelly and, and others. And, and that's great. We, we need that. But that's not as if the laity have kind of arrived at fulfillment. You know, that's not really the arrival of the laity. The arrival of the laity is when the laity live out their vocation in the world. You don't have to be working for a parish to be the church out in the world. And this is the, in our country though, I, th I think generally we have a pretty good sense of that in our culture. Um, I mean, we can always grow and get better, I think, at that. And I speak as a, as a layman, you know, I think we can, we can grow. In other places around the world, there's still a lot more of a heavily clerical culture where there's respect for the priest, but there's also kind of a uh, hands-off, like, Father does that, you know, or if there's only, like, we don't, we don't get involved. And there's very little kind of lay participation in, in different apostolates or ministries and that type of thing. It's a, it's, like a, it's a cultural reality. So when the Pope is speaking about all these things, he's not just looking at, okay, the church in the United States, like you guys need to get your act together. He's addressing the whole world. He's addressing the church throughout the world. And there's a lot of different variations of, of just where the church is, um, depending on where you are around the world. Not to say, though, like we, we have a lot of room for growth here. Um, and it's, it's healthy to admit that. So again, going back to the Theological Commission 2018, they speak of the synodality as being at the heart of the work of renewal that the Second Vatican Council was encouraging, at the heart of renewal. So, um, so that's a little bit on what synodality is. You know, again, a shorthand term, journeying together. But I think the, a more powerful way to understand it is, is really breaking open that concept that everyone is a subject, everyone is an agent of the church's mission. So everyone collaborates in her mission and is called to be a missionary disciple. So why a synod on synodality? Well, I think, I mean, what I, the quotes that already were given kind of express the importance of that, the importance of always being renewed in our mission. Um, and if synodality is, is essential to the renewal of the church's mission of evangelization today, then having a synod on this to, to really dig deeper, to pray, to pray on this and to say, how can we grow as church? Where is the Holy Spirit calling us to be? And again, Pope Francis is very strong on this. You know, only in this way can we truly renew our pastoral ministry and adapt it to the mission of the church in today's world. So Pope Francis, as you might remember, his first, his first main document, you know, after he, he did complete Pope Benedict's encyclical, The Light of Faith, that Pope Benedict had largely completed, and Pope Francis kind of put some uh, final, final work to that as he became Pope. But his first programmatic document was Joy of the Gospel, 
That came out in the fall of 2013, Evangelii Gaudium. I would say what, what he's emphasizing here with synodality is, is basically his way of trying to maybe yeah, pour gasoline on the fire of joy of the gospel, or there's probably another positive image of just really encouraging his program, his vision for evangelization. That all of us should just catch that fire of not just kind of an idea, but really being led by the fire of the Holy Spirit. Of really allowing ourselves to be in complete surrender to the Holy Spirit and being renewed in that way. So Father John Ricardo, um, whom I think you've been mentioning here, uh, and has a great book on the kerygma, on the gospel message, uh, rescued. As this synod on synodality, as the documents were being uh, put out there, um, he had this question, he, he's, he, he used this question to basically kind of say, like, I think this is really, this is the essential why. And it's a, it's a question of challenge. It's like, has the church at large lost an understanding of her mission, its urgency, and her utterly unique role in the world? This was Father John's way of saying, this is the question at the heart of this synod. This is what's at stake. You know, have, have we lost a, at large an understanding of her mission, of the church's mission, the urgency of that, and her utterly unique role in the world. And we know coming from somebody, Father John, great evangelizer, and really dedicating his time on, on sharing the kerygma, sharing the gospel message, and helping bishops, helping priests. But I thought this, was, this is a good question. Because it, for those of us that, and, and you might, and maybe after this too, you'll be attuned to kind of hear like Catholic news, you hear a lot of different opinions on the synod. There's a lot of different perspectives on the synod. And there's extremes, I would say. You know, some that just, ah, we're going to ignore it. It's going to do nothing. It's just bureaucratic process. That's one side. The other is like, hey, this is going to change the church from inside out, and uh, we're going to use it to get every, anything we want in the church. It's like, that's not what the church is. You know, that's, that's another extreme. I think it's so important to kind of focus in on the mission, focus in on evangelization, and, and to take the documents and to take the vision at their word. Uh, there's a lot of voices out there, um, and as Catholics, we have, to, we have to be discerning about that. But also, you know, to try to say, what's, what's the Holy Father's, what is, what is he getting at here? Um, and he goes back to mission a lot. He goes back to evangelization and connecting the dots um, with his with this first document, Joy of the Gospel, I think is a helpful thing to do. Okay, so the synod, the synod process that we're engaged in now is a two-year process. So Pope Francis convoked the synod last October. There's different phases of the synod, and it goes all the way up to 2023. It'll finish in a formal meeting of the bishops, the Synod of Bishops Assembly in Rome in October of 2023. But in the meantime, what's happening now I'll talk a little bit more about it, is, is a consultation phase, which it's involving every diocese in the world, where the Vatican has asked every diocese to participate. And that all leads into a, um, it, it, it basically kind of contributes to a very massive conversation, time of listening, that goes into various meetings, you know, at national level, there will be reports sent back to Rome. There will be a continental phase where different Episcopal conferences of different countries will gather together. They will send input back to Rome. And all that prepares for the meeting of bishops in 2023. There's these guiding documents. There's a preparatory document that's available on the Vatican website as well as our Archdiocesan website now. And if you'll see it on our homepage, there's a Synod button. You can get more information there. There's also a handbook for leaders of Adamecum. And I'm just going to go, go through a little bit more quickly some of the, just some pull quotes from the preparatory talk, document in the Vatimecum, just so you can kind of see, I think they're very consistent with what, what's been, how we've been preparing uh, for the Synod, what the Holy Father's been saying, what the International Theological Commission has been saying, this emphasis on mission, on proclaiming the gospel. And actually, I mean, I can, I can share these slides with Kelly afterwards too, so that you have them so you don't have to take a whole lot of notes. But 
So a basic question prompts and guides us, how does this journeying together, which takes place today on different levels, from the local level to the universal one, allow the church to proclaim the gospel in accordance with the mission entrusted to her? And what steps does the Spirit invite us to take in order to grow as a synodal church? So a basic question prompting and guiding us, how, how does this journeying together look like, but in order for us to proclaim the gospel you know, ever more joyfully, ever more effectively? And what does it mean to kind of grow as a synodal church? At a very practical level, you know, we look at parishes, we look at dioceses. There have been these, in canon law, in the church's law, there are particular structures that actually have, for a long time, been encouraging synodality, even if we haven't used the term. That's the reason why we have parish councils, finance councils, diocesan pastoral councils, these, these different bodies, and it can look different, different parishes and that type of thing, but there's a reason why that's in their canonical aspects of it. There's church law aspects. It, it's really part of this collaborative vision of the church, the synodal structure. But, but what we're talking about with synodality can't be reduced to those things, but as a starting place for maybe many places, you know, as a result of the synod, it may be kind of like, how are we doing with, like, do we have an active council? Is that something we need to renew? What does that mean? What does that look like? Um, and what does it look like to be really grounded in prayer? There's a lot of different things. So the objective of the current synod is to listen as the entire people of God to what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. The objective is to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. That's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing for us as families, married couples, individuals, in our parishes. It's never a bad thing to pause and to listen and to seek the Lord's guidance. Because if we're living as disciples, we're, we're hopefully striving to do that in some way every day, right? Every day we're, we're striving to kind of live, you know, ask the Lord's guidance. So this is in a universal way. This is a call of the whole church. We need to come together and really seek the Lord's guidance. So in fact, the whole synodal process aims at fostering a lived experience of discernment, participation, and co-responsibility where a diversity of gifts is brought together for the church's mission in the world. So again, just reaffirming those points. And then this quote, I'm not going to quote, uh, read this whole quote, but it's, it's something that from Pope Francis's address, but basically he's trying to emphasize that we don't want the synod process just to be about drafting a document that then is approved and sits on a shelf. And so even when we talk about the synod process here in the archdiocese, and there's, there's certain parameters, there's certain kind of expectations or hopes that like we'll get some feedback that'll be helpful, that'll form a diocesan report, that'll then be passed on. But that's not the most important aspect of it. The more important aspect is actually experiencing it, is, is going through the process, say whether it's at a parish level where people are coming together in prayer and, and with a spirit of listening, listening to the Holy Spirit, sharing about very particular questions and, and praying for discernment. Where's the Holy Spirit calling us? You know, so for, like a, for a pastor, it's a great way to take a pulse of the parish. It's also a great way to, to reach out. Maybe reach out to people in their families, friends that maybe have drifted away from the church, but you know, they might not want to come to Mass with us yet, but maybe they'd be interested in a conversation together. And if it's a conversation that's grounded in prayer, where we can exemplify that, that seeking the Lord's will, it's an opportunity to evangelize. First, by just the, those relationships. And we think of our time right now Coming, we're still coming out of COVID. So many people have, have been isolated, and many people haven't returned. So it's, it's interesting, the timeline. I, I mean, the Holy Father was obviously kind of seeing this in his vision. It's not just a response to COVID, but you know, something as large as a global pandemic, um, it requires a big response. And so this synod, in a way, is a great opportunity to respond to that. If it's done in the right way, you know, if it's done in a truly evangelizing way, prayer-centered way. 
And that's the difference about the synod than these other synod of bishops meetings is that the Holy Father has convoked the whole church in this time of synod. And, that, and that's kind of the language he's used as well. Whereas other synod of bishops, they're, they're a call to bishops and bishops would consult with different leaders. And um, I mean, the family synods was kind of like, that was a test run for this because it was a very large consultation. But Pope Francis in 2018 actually drafted a document to say we need the consultation of the laity as a formal part of all these global synod processes. And so this is, this is something that he's done. And so we're all invited to pray, listen, and talk together with our bishops before the bishops' formal meeting in 2023. And in our archdiocese, we hope to do the same thing, encourage that, that praying and listening and talking with one another through prayer-centered listening sessions. I'm going to I'm going to skip through some of these slides, but we can go back as, as need be. Um, I want to talk about what, what does this mean for us um, in, a, in a more practical way. So in the Archdiocese of Atlanta, so as I said, we're, we're in this consultation phase right now that actually will go through the end of April. So there's a lot of time. I mean, there's we could always have more time, but there's some time here for parishes to, to, to spend some time discerning what's the best way that we can participate in this. So we're in a time of prayer and listening, though, and, and we've really tried to emphasize as an archdiocese, it's not just like when we gather people together for listening sessions. We want it to be really prayer-centered, and as much as we can focus on the Eucharist, the better. Um, so we're, we're encouraging prayer-centered listening sessions for parishes, schools, campus ministries, other groups to do that. It could be an apostolate, it could be an ecclesial movement, to, to hold those um, and, and to really experience kind of together you know, what, what it means to come together, to listen, to pray. We're also going to be having regional prayer-centered listening sessions, and those are organized by deanery. We have 10 deaneries that cover the geographic area of the archdiocese. There'll be some for priests as well and religious and covering different groups. I think the Chancery is going to do one as well. This is just another way to, to gather together, to gain input, but to pray together and to, to share. Um, there's these particular questions all revolving around a fundamental question, like what does journeying together mean? What does that look like? And there's these themes like listening and discernment, co-responsibility and participation, talk, talking about the mission, you know, our, our responsibility for participating in the mission of the church. Also prayer, and celebration in the sense of like our is the eucharist at the center of our lives as the you know what what does that look like what does that mean and the way this archdiocese has framed these questions is that we we get together and it's not just uh, what could our parish do better or what could the archdiocese do better first it's about well how do you listen to god you know, what what does listening look like in your life you know, like, how, like what, what does the Eucharist mean to you? Those are the types of questions we lead with. And then we have other questions that, that can then build from there and talk about, you know, the life in the parish or beyond. Um, all that's going to be adapted, and, and some of that will, it'll depend on, you know, it depends on each pastor's discernment for their parish. So it's going to look different in different parishes, and we're, we're fine with that. Um, but that's part of the, part of it, the most important part is actually kind of doing it is experiencing it. There is an online survey that's available on the Synod website, and that, that complements all these efforts. It's not the ideal because we don't really have an encounter there, um, but we're, we're getting good feedback from people from that. So we encourage everybody to take the online survey. So y'all take the online survey, fill it out. Um, I think there's been at least 1,400 people filled out so far, and it's been promoted very little. So just get the word out on that. It's a good way to get feedback. There's a lot more resources on our website, archatl.com forward slash synod, and there's particular resources to, to help parishes, schools, those are those that are in groups that would facilitate sessions, but I won't go into more depth there. But all of this is, this is kind of the, the process from the archdiocesan angle. It's going gonna, it's gonna to affect us in different ways, and for some people, they may still like, you know, we come to the end of this consultation phase, and it's like, what? Like, there was a synod? Like, what? What happened? And that, that's just the way it is, and, and that's okay. Um, we're trying to be realistic about it. But 
you know, we have an opportunity here. Like I'm speaking to you about the Synod, which is amazing. Thanks for having me. And, and that you all are actually listening and engaging, like thinking about what, yeah, what is this all about? What does this mean? I wanted to bring it down to just kind of a more of a, like a local level, like my own heart, your heart, your soul. What does this mean for you individually? What does this mean for you as a family? And also thinking about the parish as well um, in, in the larger community. Three areas I'll focus on and I'll close with, with these areas so that we can have some Q&A. So prayer. As I said at the very beginning of the presentation, synods are first and foremost exercises in deep prayer. They, they will not succeed if there is not a, a calling upon the Holy Spirit, a calling upon the Lord, a gathering around the Lord Jesus in the Eucharist, is, is submitting everything over to the Father. This is what synods are. And there have been, there have been kind of bad synods in the church that have, not, not our ecumenical councils, but other kind of local things, you know, things that go astray. We might be familiar with challenges currently, you know, globally. Um, this, is a, this is a call to be grounded in prayer. You know, Jesus reminds us, without me you can do nothing. So any exercise of synodality, any exercise, it, it, it's nothing without Jesus at the center of it. And we hear that call from Deuteronomy 6.4, Shema Israel, like, hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God. Hear, hear, listen, listen, Israel. And Jesus calling his disciples, listen, listen to me. That's the first and foremost place of the synod. It's us to listen, not, not just to listen to the world. It's first to listen to the Lord. We have to be grounded in that listening to the Lord. So this is very biblical. Um, and, to, and to kind of see this as an opportunity for us to be challenged in our prayer life. Do I seek to listen to the Lord? And I, I say that as a challenge to my own heart because I, I am just confounded, confounded, whatever the word is, with distractions constantly and with busyness and this was such a gift today to be able to arrive here early and I, I forgotten I didn't realize there was a holy hour before the mass so I was like able to just sit in front of the Lord and what a what a gift that is but but also to kind of strive to listen to listen to the Lord and are we doing that daily the synod is a call to that to that listening and Pope Francis talks about this style of of synodality he uses the terms encountering listening and discerning all of that, though, is, is relying on, on the Holy Spirit, on his work. Pope Francis talks about this, the synod is a process of spiritual discernment, of ecclesial discernment that unfolds in adoration, in prayer, and in dialogue with the Word of God. So clear where this needs to be centered. And so this is the reason why we're doing prayer-centered listening sessions here in the Archdiocese. You know, why we're really emphasizing, you know, this prayerful listening of the Word of God, listening to the Holy Spirit. And then having that as the context of then listening to each other. Because we, we learn from each other. We grow in the Lord through each other. You know, the Lord speaks to us, you know, not only through his inspired word, but also through each other. So we learn from that. So when we gather together in prayer, Jesus is in, in our midst. So what can we do now? You know, just, you know, what are the areas in our life where we can grow in our relationship with the Lord, and especially in our prayer life where we can grow in listening. What does that look like as a family? What does that look like as a married couple? What does that look like for me individually? And that all leads us to the Eucharist. You know, this synod ultimately is, has to be centered around the Eucharist, and we have such a great opportunity in our country because providentially, um, I mean, we can't plan this, but the bishops have called for a national Eucharistic revival starting this coming June and going all the way through 2024, 2025. And, and we actually in the Archdiocese are in a time of Eucharistic renewal as kind of a preparatory year. You know, we had, we had asked parishes to do something special for Corpus Christi and to just continue that. I mean, you all are living that out well here. You know, you're placing, placing the Lord in the center, the Lord in the Eucharist in the center but we have this, this great opportunity before us, this National Eucharistic Revival. You're going to be hearing more about it. Our Eucharistic Congress this June is going to be our launch 
um, of this, of this three-year revival time. When we talk about synods and synodality and, and that type of thing, as I said, the mass is really at the center of it. That, that's the most basic expression of synodality. We live that out as faithful Catholics every Sunday and perhaps even more you know, during daily mass. And so it's actually an ex- this expression of synodality. So you know, when a synod that's, that's looking, that's focusing in on synodality, on just this concept, it, it can't help but be focused in on the Eucharist. And so as much as possible as we can kind of make the Eucharist at the center of parish sessions, and, it, and for some groups, you know, may, they may not be able to kind of sit before the Lord in the Eucharist, but what if you tap some people to, to pray for the session, to be intercessors, you know, to pray before the Lord so that this prayer-centered listening session bears the fruit that the Lord wants it to bear. You know, if it's Eucharistically centered and devoted, the synod itself, this exercise that we're going through right now, can till the soil for what's to come with this Eucharistic revival. Briefly, the, so this Eucharistic revival, there's going to be a diocesan phase that will move into a parish phase, and then with a national congress in 2024, with the idea of sending out Eucharistic missionaries. Here in this archdiocese, we're, we're discerning, okay, what, what does this look like, and how can we make this not just a program that has an end point, but that really generates, helps generate renewal. So I, I'd ask your prayers for that. I'd also ask, uh, you know, keep the Eucharistic Congress on your calendar. It's meant to be a launch of this revival um, for us locally. We're going to have Bishop Cousins, who's the head of the Bishop's Committee, the head of the National Revival, uh, speaking at the Congress. Um, so it'll be a great event, a great opportunity. But, but right now, you know, how do we commit ourselves and commit our families more to the Eucharist? And that may not be, a, I think you're, you're living that out well here in the parish, but for others, you know, how do we continue to do that? And then finally, the last, last point, and I'm sorry I'm going right up to time, but evangelization. <laughs> evangelization. So, you know, what, what, what is evangelization ultimately? Like we know it's, it's proclaiming the Lord Jesus. It's, it's proclaiming the gospel proclaiming the story. It's, it's inviting people to an encounter with the Lord Jesus so that their lives are transformed, that they're, they're liberated, that we're freed, that we're rescued, and that, we have a, and that we're made for communion, communion with Jesus and his church. But often, what does that look like at the practical level? Um, you know, there are some people that, like, yeah, are like going off, you know, street preachers and that type of thing, and we need those folks. But in our lives, generally, it happens through relationships, right? It's building that trust, building those relationships. Um, it's, it's, it's the long-term game where then we, we, we start sharing our relationship with Jesus, our, you know, what it means to be Catholic with people that we've built a level of trust with, of relationships. So I think we all know, so in, in any relationship, in any friendship, listening is so important, right? Like, it's not going to go very far without, without active listening. And, and listening is really the, the foundation of being able to proclaim the gospel, proclaim the kerygma. Listening is the basis of everything that the church is, in a sense, because the church teaches because she has first received. She has first heard the word. She has received the word and is able to proclaim and teach. And the same kind of process happens to us as individuals. Yeah, we receive, like I think of so many great teachers I've had in my life, and they've been great teachers because they've been great listeners, and they've been great witnesses as well. And they've passed on their faith in very credible ways because you know it wasn't just them talking, like I'm talking, but it's, it's actually lived out. It's an example that, is, that means something. This whole synod process, it can remain at a, at a weak level if it's, if it's not firmly entrenched into this vision of evangelization. If it's just, uh, we're, getting, we're getting the listening done, we're getting these sessions so we can move out a report and we say we checked off the box and we did it, boom. But what if this is an opportunity to really reach out to those folks that we know, that maybe we have bridges of trust with, that maybe aren't really excited about the church. Or they're Catholic, but they haven't really been to Mass in a while. Or there's there are different folks that we know that we can reach out to and invite. 
the Synod opportunity is a great chance to do that, to reconnect, to invite, to listen, to pray together. And it doesn't have to be necessarily in a formal prayer-centered listening session. It could just be in your neighborhood, in your family. You know, talk to them. Maybe even share. Like, share like, hey, you know what? Catholic Church is kind of doing this thing right now. I wanted to just ask you, like, how are you doing? How are you doing with the church these days? Like, we haven't talked about that much. Um, there's so many ways that we can reach out to people. And there's a lot of cynicism out there, and a lot of it's understandable. I think we know that. There's a lot of lack of trust in institutions these days. There's a lot of lack of credibility out there in leadership. That's all understandable. But as disciples of the Lord Jesus, we're called to something greater. We are called to something greater than cynicism. Even if, even if we understand it, and even if we feel it, which we do, I'm sure we do, when we're faced with a lot of challenges, a lot of negative things, a lot of questionable things that are out there. But we're called to be lights. So I'd say the Synod is, is a, it's a call to this ongoing conversion for us. What can we do now? Whom can we reach out to in fellowship and, and witness? Okay. I had two final s- slides on listening as a conclusion. I've already made some of those points, but I think just to conclude, you know, sometimes, I mean, I, I've, I've heard this, you know, all this emphasis on listening, all this emphasis on dialogue, like the church just needs to teach. Like, we're not, we're not teaching. We're not proclaiming the truth. Like, what's going on with that? Like, why is this all this emphasis on listening? But I want to say it's not, it's not either or. Yes, yes, the church needs to teach. And sometimes there's been opportunities where, yeah, we haven't taught as clearly as we could or as compassionately, as charitably as we could to really help the truth shine. But all of that has to be founded in listening. And, and listening is not like a new thing. It's not a new fad. It's not something where it's just like it's being emphasized, a kind of new agey type thing. This is, this is basic. It's biblical. And then it's like how we listen is biblical. You know, Jesus emphasizes, you know, not only like listen, like really listen attentively. Listen with your heart. And so you see people like St. Benedict, St. Augustine, St. Francis talk about this listening with the heart, how important that is in being Christian. And so Pope Francis says, you know, we are losing the ability to listen to those in front of us. And, and not, not to put young people under the bus, but I, you know, I, think, I think this involves the whole culture. But we see a lot of young people, too. It's, it's a challenge with the phone because they've been brought up. You know, the, the younger generations have been brought up. They don't know a time without, like, a smartphone in front of them. So you see at bus stops, you know, young people looking at their phone and not being able to like, look at the person right next to them and have a conversation. But it's not just young people. It's all of us are challenged by this in ways. But we're, we're losing the art of listening. Social media, where it's like you can kind of put whatever you want out there, get it out. Like somebody says something, it's like, that's crazy. I'm going to send it out, push it out. Nobody's listening to each other. Political discourse, debates, like when has a debate actually had illustrated good listening and been interesting? It's just kind of getting the sound bites out there and see who gets, gets more sound bites out and who kind of wins, you know, with that. So, you know, we're getting close to Lent. We're, we're you know, we're a month away. And it's just a great time for us as, as the synod process is unfolding during the Lenten season, as we're looking towards revival, all these different things. You know, I just thought finishing on this kind of, this emphasis on the importance of listening as a, as a real Christian discipline. Um, in, in thinking of our own lives, like where can we cultivate more silence in our lives? How can we cultivate adoration more? Both like literal adoration before the Blessed Sacrament, but being just in adoration of the Lord. Um, how can we you know, listen to the Word, listen to others in our families, you know, take the time to do that, wonder, at the gift of creation, look at a sunset and like, wow, that's great. Lord, praise you. Praise you. And then this asceticism in the face of all the distractions, all the comforts, all the noise that we have, thinking of what can we kind of peel back. All of this is part of this call of synodality, I argue, at least. It needs to be. And when we, if we don't hear it being at the center of it, we need to bring it at the center of it. Um, 
and be a voice for this is a real opportunity for the church to grow in her mission. So let's pray for this. I, I ask you to, to join me in praying for this synod process that it really bears the fruit that the Lord intends it to bear for the church in the, in the short term and being realistic about like where it might be able to help the church grow, but in the long term, that it can really flower a, a new springtime of evangelization, you know, exactly what, what our popes have been calling for. So you can get more information about what I do um, at our Office of Evangelization and Discipleship. It's a new name that we changed last week. It used to be Formation and Discipleship, but to really emphasize the importance of the mission of evangelization is grounding everything that the church does. And then I also have the link there to the Synod. So I am beyond time, so thank you very much. <laughs> it, I don't know if there's time for any Q&A, but uh, I'm open to it. I'll stick around, but I don't want anybody to feel like they need to stick around. So thanks. <laughs> Janice. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, Janice. Well, we're going to look to you for some help on that too. But yeah, so so Janice asked the question first. First, kind of where does all this go? Like where where do the all the submissions go? The reports and and who gets to see it? What does that look like? And then you know, in terms of the the hope, you know, that we're able to generate more you know more interest, more people coming back to the church. How do we help with that? So um, we still need to brainstorm a little bit on the, on the second question, I think. And there's, there's a lot of great initiatives out there, and, and part of that is, and part of it is the, is the prayer aspect, you know, with the synod itself, like being a, a time for prayer and real discernment. Part of it may arise through the process as well. There's, there's, when we talk about parish renewal, when we talk about renewal of family life, renewal in the church in general, there's a lot of different places that that takes shape. You know, it takes place in families. It also takes place in kind of the leadership culture at the parish. Um, and there's a lot of things that need to kind of work together on that. So, but let's, let's brainstorm some more on that. In terms of the question on, on just the data in, in the reporting. So, so parishes, groups that do listening sessions, and then the regional sessions I was talking about, like, for instance, for a parish, a parish might hold one listening session, with like a small group format, perhaps, and, or multiple listening sessions. But every parish will be asked to generate one report that goes to the archdiocese. All those reports, so the 100 plus parishes, plus other groups, apostolates that maybe have their own sessions and send in reports, which were we're encouraging that, so it's not just through the parish. Like anything that goes at the parish level goes through the pastor, and then there's a, there's a report template that's going to be online that people can fill out with the approval of the pastor, obviously, or, or, with his, or him doing it too, but being authorized. All that will go into a 10-page diocesan report. And you might be wondering, like, ah, like 10 pages. Like. But, so the Holy See has asked every diocese to submit a 10-page report based on the experience of the synod. And this is, this is one reason why like the documents, they're important, but they're not the be all end all of this. Because like what happens at the parish, we're gonna get a certain condensation of that through the report. We're gonna get highlights. We're also gonna get kind of like, what'd you do? How was the experience? You know, what, what were you guys praying about? We're, all, we're also asking like for, some feedback that would maybe assist, particularly the archdiocese, in kind of the, the more macro discernment of 
where do we need to be as an archdiocese? But there's also feedback that's going to be helpful for the parish as well. You know, that really goes, it's more important for the pastor. It's not as important maybe for us, even though we're going to see a certain amount of it on the reports. But you, you have those reports then go to the bishops' conference in the U.S., and that's the way it is around every, every country. Every Episcopal conference will be receiving reports from their dioceses. They send all that. They, they create a synthesis report that then goes to Rome. And I'm sorry I'm getting into the weeds here, but Rome will then create a working document that's called an instrumentum laboris that is the basis of further conversations. So just like the preparatory document has been sort of like the starter of this process, a working document will then feed into what are going to be continental gatherings. And this is another new thing that hasn't happened before, where you'll have continents gathering together, Episcopal conferences from, from various continents gathering together, then sending more feedback to Rome, which will be another working document. And that second working document will then go into the preparation for the bishop's Synod, synod meeting in uh, that October of 2023. But, but, and that may result in an apostolic exhortation from our Holy Father, or you may kind of, that may result in a report from the Synod of Bishops that then has kind of further ramifications for the church. You know, the, we're talking about, okay, what is synodality? What are the implications of that? What does that mean? Where do we need to go? It's, it's a long process, and I, I'd say in certain ways, it can kind of seem like, well, like what we're doing like means almost nothing, right? But I'd say what you're doing is the most important. It's the local stuff that is really going to generate more of the long term. Um, if it's, I mean, I, I'd say both and. Yeah, I don't want to say most important, but it's, it's different than past synods. Because this is like a real a call to kind of live something and experience something that should be reflective of normal workings in parish life, normal workings in chancery life. Like, do we collaborate well? Do we have a culture of teamwork? Do we have a culture of prayer? Do we have a culture of discipleship in our chancery offices? You know, how does that look like at our parishes? How does that look like in our families? So I know that's a, a little bit of a long answer, but getting back to it though too, our, the diocesan report will be published. So everyone's gonna be able to see that. Um, what, what remains to be seen and is the next steps of like, what, what do we do with this? So part of it has to be prayed over. I think the Eucharistic revival is going to be a nice opportunity. It's not the only thing. I mean, it's not, it's not like, okay, we move from the Synod to the Eucharistic revival. We're going to have to take what we receive in the Synod and, and really think of that seriously and, and take it to prayer and, and see where the Lord is leading us. Okay. Oh, are, are you looking at the, um, that, that must be the image from the Vatican. Is that this, which is, yeah, there should, there should be an explanation on the Vatican website. This is, this is the Vatican logo, and it's a very colorful logo. It's, it's a logo for this synod on synodality, yeah, the synod process which I think they probably do have an explanation on the, on the website. So I would, I would refer you to that. Um, there's, 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 you know, Holy Spirit, Jesus, but, you know, with, with the bishops and the people and the priests and the religious walking together, that's, that's the idea of it. Some people are, get super excited about the logo and they're real gung-ho about it. Others are like, yeah, this, you know, it's like, Maybe could have been better. Some dioceses have adapted it uh, in different ways. We just decided, well, we're gonna we'll use what the Holy See put out and 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 move forward. So, but it is meant to be that that sense of journeying together, that walking together as the church, you know, under the guidance of the Lord. Great, thanks, y'all. Thanks for your patience. Yep.